bandwidth purposes, we would like to request you keep your microphone and video off until the end. Uh, should you have any questions during the presentation, um, I'll watch the chat uh, box and we'll interrupt at the appropriate time. Otherwise, please feel free to ask uh, questions following the presentation. Thank you. All right. So today it's our, uh, our pleasure to have Lindsay uh, LeBlanc as our speaker from the uh, University of Alberta. Um, so she was an undergrad in engineering physics at the University of Alberta and did her PhD at the University of Toronto. She did, then did a postdoc at JQI in Maryland uh, before, before going back to the University of Alberta, where she's a Canada Research Chair and also called Quantum Gases Associate Professor in Physics. And today she's going to tell us about storing and manip manipulating uh, electromagnetic systems using atoms. So, Lindsay, thanks for coming, and please go ahead. All right. Thank you coming in, so let me know if it gets annoying. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you so much for the invitation. It really is my pleasure to be able to talk to you all today. Um, I did see one of my former students in the chat, but, or the participants, Chen, but I did, she disappeared, so maybe she'll come back. <laughs> but it's, it's fun to see some a bunch of faces that I know, um, even remotely. So um, yeah, I want to get started and tell you today about some of the work we're doing, particularly in quantum memory and manipulating microwave signals. But just before I do, um, I would like to acknowledge that uh, as a part of the University of Alberta, we're located on Treaty 6 territory, which is the traditional gathering place of uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. And this is an important statement, um, especially here in Canada, where we're working towards reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples and um, recognizing that this land um, is has been here for a long time. And one of the, the things that reminded me of that actually I was preparing this talk, um, we actually had a really nice display of the Northern Lights, uh, which happens once in a while, but is still fairly rare. And so um, I, I was just uh, interrupted from preparing this talk for quite some time while going outside to look at these. So um, yeah, it was a, a really, really nice evening last night. So just wanted to give a little plug for Northern Canada here while I can. So, um, I wanted to give a little bit of a background on uh, our work here at the University of Alberta. Um, I'm sort of the, the lone atomic physicist, um, but I'm working in a number of different systems. And uh, we have work on uh, Bose-Einstein condensation and quantum simulation, actually veering more towards quantum computing these days. I won't really talk about that today. Um, but another uh, area that I've gotten into since moving here to the University of Alberta is uh, working in atomic quantum memory. So I'll, I'll talk about that for the bulk of my talk today, as well as look um, some warm atom systems where we look at microwave atom optics as well. And then we've got a third sort of laboratory underway where we're developing a hybrid quantum system. And that's really just in the engineering and construction phase. So I won't talk too much about that, but that is um, sort of an exciting path forward for us. So today let's concentrate on thinking about the uh, quantum memory and the microwave atom optics. So to start with, um, what are we talking about with the quantum memory? Well, the basic idea is that we have some kind of quantum memory medium, in our case it's atoms, but um, people use many different quantum media to do this. Uh, and the idea is that we have some kind of input signal that we want to store inside of our medium. We use a control mechanism, you can or cannot use one depending on what your protocol is, and then the idea is to get the same signal out after some storage time. So that's the basic idea of what we mean by quantum memory. And it has many potential applications throughout uh, networking. Uh, so quantum repeaters may be one of the early applications that might be useful. And this is largely for synchronization tasks. So if you're sending two signals and you want to distribute entanglement over a large distance, uh, one of the ways to do that is to implement a quantum repeater where you will need to make joint measurements between two say photons to entangle them, um, but say they don't arrive at exactly the same time, a quantum memory might be a nice device in order to do that synchronization task. So that's just one uh, possible example, but also um, you can think about turning uh, a probabilistic source of single photons into a deterministic one by storing uh, the photon until you need it. You can think about you know, longer term tasks of actually storing information for a quantum computer, um, but also many different sort of signal processing tasks um, that you could use the quantum memory for, not so much as a memory, but just as a processor. Uh, where you could pulses, you can do uh, temporal beam splitting, which I'll talk about, and also wavelength conversion, um, which I won't talk about, but is something we're thinking about as well. 
So we're by no means the only people or, or the first people to do this sort of quantum memory work. It's been around for many years, sort of 20 years ago, it really uh, kicked off with um, some experiments in Harvard and MIT. Um, and now people use all sorts of media to implement these quantum memories from warm atoms and cold atoms, which is sort of where my interests lie, but also in the ion dope solids, which I know uh, for example, Elizabeth's working on and also color centers um, such as the nitrogen vacancy, but also many other solid state systems um, where people are looking at uh, atom like defects. So anything basically that has a quantum degree of freedom, you can think about using as a quantum memory. And this is a very incomplete list of people who have been working in this, these sorts of systems. So think about what are the mechanisms to use this quantum memory. Um, there's usually sort of two uh, categories that people will give for how to store quantum information in a medium like one of these. And so adiabatic memories um, are one classification where basically you, you try to actually eliminate absorption. So you sort of preserve as much of the signal as you want because you don't have any losses associated with absorption. And electromagnetically induced transparency or EIT is really the way uh, that does this very well because you are accessing an actual dark state. Another method is to go off resonance um, using two photon transitions. And this is another method that's um, been fairly successful. So most of these systems will use some kind of three level system uh, where you have a signal and a control. And um, this is gonna be familiar to what we, we see. It doesn't have to be a Lambda, it can be a ladder or a V or, or a different kind of system, but um, many of them are this Lambda configuration. In contrast, uh, there's also uh, an approach which people will call fast memories, where you actually harness the fact that light can be absorbed in your medium. And then you wanna control um, that absorption process. And one way to think about it is that you have a bunch of different um, absorbers and their little dipoles, almost classical, and they will oscillate with their own little dipole moments. And if you can synchronize those oscillations, when everything rephases with each other, you'll get a strong emission of light um, at that rephasing time. And so it's a little bit more um, baked in what the timing of these things are, although you can do some tricks to control that as well. Um, but in general, these can these usually work much faster because that rephasing time can be quite quick. Whereas if you're relying on the adiabaticity of the dark state production, that can be quite slow. So these are sort of, you know, each has its advantages and disadvantages, and, and they both can work in different kinds of platforms. So when we're thinking about quantum memory, what do we care about? There's a number of different performance criteria and you'll find that many different systems will sort of do one well at one or two of these, but maybe not so well at the other, other two, one or two. So um, efficiency is one of these things, which is basically what is the probability that you get a signal out after putting a signal in? How long can you hold this information for? So that has to do with the coherence of your storage medium. There's also considerations around bandwidth and multiplexing. So um, thinking about the, the frequency of your signal and how much of information you can store at a time. And then there's also issues of noise and fidelity. So if you get a signal out, how sure are you that the signal you put in is the one that you're getting out? Uh, and so there can be different things that can exist in, in these systems. So in our lab, we've been um, working with a system we call the Ottler Towns protocol. Uh, and we'll hopefully see why that is in a bit. Um, but what we've sort of stumbled upon is that we're able to combine aspects of both these fast and slow memories, the adiabatic and the fast memories in this protocol um, and realize a quantum memory protocol that is actually hits a lot of these um, um, performance indicators, maybe not the best in any one of them, but is good in, in several. So it is broadband, it's very low noise, um, it can be very efficient and also can be capable of long storage times, although the efficiency and storage time we have yet to demonstrate really long um, or really good efficiency, but um, we do believe that the system can do that. So the basic um, setup looks like these adiabatic systems where we have uh, this sort of system and we're gonna store information in, in a spin wave, um, but it operates a little bit more like the fast memory. So we're sort of combining these two approaches in one. So um, in thinking about, okay, how do we go about doing this? Um, we're going to sort of stop and think, okay, what do we need to do to implement this quantum memory? And at the very basic level, what we're doing is taking a signal that is encoded in a photonic degree of freedom, um, where we start with sort of an empty memory and then transform that so that we leave the photonic mode empty and have transferred the uh, information into the atomic degree of freedom. And of course, we also want to reverse this process, but if we can do it one way in principle, we should be able to, to get it back out again. So um, I'm gonna sort of take you through the, 
very simple um, configuration and hope um, to be able to explain this to you. So we have a uh, system in this Lambda configuration. Um, for those who are familiar with atomic physics, we're actually using rubidium. These are the two hyperfine ground states of the rubidium, and this is one of the um, optically excited states. Uh, these two states ideally will form what we call a forbidden transition. So there should be no sort of natural spontaneous decoherence um, between these two levels. And for that reason, these two levels will make a good storage state. So we can imagine a superposition between these two states, which will be the superposition that holds our information that we want to store. To, to round out the, the Lambda system here, uh, we have two beams, two different frequencies, because they have different lengths here, that connect these two ground states. So we can't directly couple them, but we can couple them through this two photon transition. And in our case, we're going to consider one of these the signal, um, and we'll use that um, hat here to indicate that we're considering an actual quantum field here. And on the other arm, we're going to have a strong electromagnetic signal that we'll call the control, and we're going to consider this one classically. Um, even though, of course, we could do both quantum mechanically, but we don't need to bother with this one. So the idea here is that we have a very strong control transition, and that is sort of where this Ottler Towns business comes in. Because if we have a very strong control transition here, what we're addressing these two levels so that we create a quantum superposition between, you know, uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations of these. Um, and then if we send a signal to be absorbed, um, on the signal arm over here, what we see is actually a splitting of these levels and it splits by the Rabi frequency associated with the coupling between these E and S levels that we have here. And so the amount of splitting you see depends on the amount of electric field or um, the square root of the intensity of that light. So that is a knob we can turn in the lab. We can turn up our laser power, get a strong coupling here, which means we get a strong splitting between here. So this is an effect that's been known for a long time. Um, we also call it the AC Stark effect. Um, and so many of you should be familiar with this. Um, if you start, you know, this is measured in the lab, we start with a, a, a rubidium absorption line that has a sort of, sorry, six megahertz uh, natural line width, and then we can split that. And so we will say that we're in this Altler Towns regime when the splitting is much greater, say, than the natural line width, uh, which is um, the, the yeah, absorption line width divided by two in these units. In practice, we're, we're usually only slightly greater than um, in, the, in the lab, but it actually seems to be pretty robust to that. So we can work even in that regime. So just to show that we can measure that that splitting scales as the square root of the control power. So indeed we're in this Adler Town splitting limit. Um, and then what we wanna do is think about how do we actually transform quantum information from one, um, from the light into this atomic medium. And so we're going to consider two coherences. Uh, the polarization coherence, what we mean by that, it's just a measurement of basically how much you have between, say, the ground and excited state. So if you uh, use this mathematical object, which is the outer product of, of these two states, um, if, if you have a superposition, that'll give you a non-zero number. But if you're, say, all in the ground state, this measure will give you zero. So the polarization coherence measures how much superposition we have between these two levels. Um, and that's going to be related to the signal field that comes in. So the signal field that will drive that polarization. In contrast, we also have spin coherence when, again, it's the same sort of measure where we have the superposition between now the G and um, and this is a measure of how much superposition we have between these. Um, these, of course, have a forbidden transition, but this is where we want to store the information. So if we want, uh, basically we want to drive the information into this coherence. And the idea that we can use is that um, basically we can Robbie flop between these two coherences. So if we had a two level system and we shone a field at it, um, say, then it should transform to the, the ground state back up periodically with the Robbie frequency. And that Robbie frequency is just related to the strength of the field that couples these two levels. Instead of thinking about the populations or the amplitudes in these two levels, we can now think about sort of a flopping between coherences. So if we start with a polarization coherence and we turn on a strong control field, the, the amplitude from E transforms to the amplitude to S, but instead we can actually think of it as the polarization transforming to the spin coherence back to the polarization coherence, sort of back and forth in that way. Um, we can represent this mathematically using the optical block equations or the Maxwell block equations, where we can look at the evolution of the elect this electric field, which I haven't drawn here, but also the polarization and spin. So you can just rewrite these amplitudes in terms of these coherences that we've defined 
it's a bit of a complex set of equations, but they're solvable. Um, but just for the sake of our argument, we can make some approximations which say that the relaxation levels is small. Uh, that's actually this one here, and that the line width is smaller than this Robbie flopping rate. And that gives us a simple set of differential equations. And if you just look at these bottom ones here, it's just a simple harmonic oscillator. So we have P depends on S and S depends on P with time derivatives. And this is the set of equations I solve in my first year physics class. So I actually like to show them this. Um, and the idea here is that if you send in the electric field, it's just directly proportional to this polarization. It drives a polarization coherence that Robbie flops to a spin coherence, back to polarization, back to spin, back to polarization. And every time you get a polarization coherence, you get an emission of light because physically what you're, redo what you're doing is establishing a dipole moment between these two levels, which classically will radiate. And um, in the quantum mechanical picture that happens as well. And so you actually get an electric field um, emitted in that way. So this is a very simple model where we have just a, a nice harmonic um, oscillation. But if you solve for the full set of equations numerically, which is easy enough to do, um, you can see how the quantum memory might work. So if we just leave that um, Rabi frequency on the control side on, if we send in some light, then after one period, um, in terms of that Rabi frequency, we will get light come back out of the system. And if you calculate what's going on internally, um, you send in your photonic uh, field here that transforms to a polarization coherence and then uh, half a period out of phase you get a spin coherence back to a polarization coherence back to an electric field which is emitted and then you can actually see that there's sort of revivals of this uh, coherence that come at later multiples of this um, Robbie time and so this is a very simple sort of quantum memory that is of these fast memories um, in the solid state systems that have been around for 10 years, um, where you have a sort of fixed delay time and a rephasing of the dipole moments uh, that happens because you sort of excited them all coherently and then they rephase and then they re-emit. The nice thing about doing this with the atoms and the AC Stark shift or the Otler town splitting is that you can turn off that coupling um, pretty easily. So what you can do is then basically start the same way. You have light come in, it establishes a polarization coherence, which then flips into a spin coherence. But at that moment, if your timing is good, then you can turn off the control. And now those levels are no longer coupled. You have the spin coherence sort of isolated. You can store that for some time until you decide to turn the control field back on and then restart that emission process. And so you start that Robbie flopping between the polarization and spin coherence at a later time. Um, and you have sort of an on-demand storage of the fields in this way. So one of the other nice features of this system is that um, the sort of Robbie flop doesn't really uh, depend on timing, but it depends on the pulse area. So it depends on sort of the product of the field strength times the time. And basically so long as you integrate over that field for some time, in our units, if that's equal to two pi, you go from transforming your system from a polarization coherence to a spin coherence. And so in some way it's sort of independent, you can, you can tailor the timing um, and by changing the, the, the sort of field strength. Um, and so- Lindsay, yes. uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, we've got a question in the chat from Elizabeth. Um, so fast memories like in atomic frequency combs often have fundamental limits on the recall efficiency related to the recovery type behavior. Is that true here too? Yes. So it actually has a very similar, um, it has the same scaling. And um, if you recall in the same sort of forward, forward direction, I think it's the same 56% uh, recovery efficiency you get from an AFC system, but we can also recover in the backwards direction and get full 100% efficiency. Um, so we do our experiments in the forward direction, but um, all of our calculations are actually backwards so that we can get that sort of 100% efficiency in the reverse direction. I think that's, yeah. That's your okay. Point. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, so there's, we have this pulse area condition um, with the system, which allows us to um, sort of change the, the area and also the shape of our output pulses. And so if we just run some calculations, we can see that by shaping the, the control pulse here, we've just used a Gaussian because that's quite simple. Um, we can sort of optimize the amount of spin that we can store, store it. And then again, at the recall, we use a Gaussian shaped output pulse and sort of the sort of square that we used last time, uh, we can tailor the shape of the output and actually get um, a somewhat more efficient um, 
recall. And you can actually think of this in, in sort of the frequency spectrum is that we're actually sweeping through um, by turning the control uh, on and off, the, the Otler Towns peaks are actually sweeping back and forth. And so in some ways we're sort of scanning different frequency components and that actually helps you uh, to get nicer looking pulses at the output. Um, and actually we haven't done a lot of work on this, but I think it probably can be optimized by doing some nice pulse shaping, which is the kind of work that has been done in other kinds of quantum memories uh, quite um, extensively. All right, so um, I've sort of talked about how, okay, we could create a superposition state between these ground and excited states, but I've glossed over the fact many atoms in this system. And um, really what we're doing is collectively exciting a whole ensemble of atoms um, at once. In principle, I guess you could do this with single trapped atoms, and maybe that is something that somebody wants to try someday. Um, but we are using these collective um, ensembles. And when we do that, what we're really doing is creating a superposition that's a superposition of, say, one at the single photon level would be one atom among the whole ensemble being excited, but that's a sum over the possibility of every one of those atoms being excited. So it's this um, collective uh, state that we've got going on. And another um, aspect of this is that it actually has a spatial structure to it. So the phase that we have we get in the superposition depends on the relative wave vectors of these two beams, which remember have slightly different frequencies. And so their K vectors are slightly different. Um, and there's also sort of a time factor that we're rotating out of this picture as well. So you do get a spatial structure. And uh, for co-propagating beams, the one I just described, you get actually, you can think of it as like an interference pattern between these two slightly different frequencies. Um, and so, you know, they're only different by gigahertz out of terahertz, the so part in 10 to the four or five, um, but on a sort of millimeter scale, not quite millimeter, but say it was about a millimeter scale atom cloud, you are actually going to get sort of uh, fringes of, of places where you basically, if you look at this, um, this coherence regions where you do have the superposition and then uh, you don't, and then you do, and then you don't. So you get a periodicity in that um, in that uh, superposition state. Um, and this is called a spin wave. Uh, and it depends on say the angles with which you use these um, control and probe beams. That's the K and the P that I've got here. So if you write um, your memory at an angle, which you can do and which we do, um, you get a different interference pattern of that spin wave. And so when you're thinking about actually storage times and um, you know, how long you can hold this information for, this spatial structure actually turns out to matter quite a lot. The other nice thing about thinking about this in terms of the spatial structure though, is actually, this is very reminiscent of classical optics once again. And so you can think now of medium as being a photographic film in a hologram. And what we're doing is actually imprinting a phase pattern. So we're imprinting pattern between these two beams into the atoms and at locations where you know you get constructive interference you get the superposition and where you get destructive interference you get no superposition and you're really writing that information the phase and amplitude and frequency information from these two beams into the atomic state and in that way that's how we can think about the memory preserving that information it's 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 very classical in that sense and then when you go to read the, the information out, you apply the control beam and you can think of it diffracting off of this superposition or this diffraction grading basically, or interference pattern that you've written into the atoms. And the beam that you get out, like in a hologram will be an identical sort of match to the beam that you sent in because you set up these conditions for constructive interference at the writing stage. And so that's sort of another way to think about the reason you the beam that you get out is the same as the one that you put in. It's a lot like this sort of hologram picture. And you can do, you know, vector matching and phase matching conditions as well. It's, you know, <laughs> there's many ways to think about this, um, but I do like the sort of hologram picture as well. So, um, so that's the Otler Towns memory. Um, it's a spin wave memory, and that's not unique to the Otler town. So the EIT memories are also spin wave memories, the Raman memories um, as well. And so it sort of has that character of the adiabatic memory in the storage picture um, that's a little bit different than the fast memory picture. And so we're often actually asked this question, especially when we first started doing this, is this really any different than EIT? The system that you've set up, you have a probe, 
sure, the powers are different. Is it really different than an EIT or adiabatic memory? And so the two regimes we're thinking about with EIT, you have a very weak uh, control while similar uh, amplitudes of, of probe and control. And so you get some kind of splitting, but that splitting is actually much narrower. So this, um, in terms of the, the line width, the, the splitting is much narrower than the line width, whereas in the ATS picture, and this is again a bit of a cartoon, the, you can have splitting, which is much uh, greater than the natural line width, which is the width of these green peaks here. So we're in, we're in very different regimes. And we did do some work to sort of connect these two, uh, which is shown in this mega slide here. Um, and the punchline is, is that yes, the two are connected smoothly from EIT to ATS. You can, you can sort of transform between the character of the EIT type memory and the ATS when you're in the center. But um, at the extremes, the difference is that in the EIT memory, you never have a polarization coherence. So this is looking at those coherences because you have this dark state that you create. And so you never actually get any population in the excited state and you have a dark state polariton, which you are sort of directly transform from the photonic mode to the spin mode. And that is very efficient. And that's very nice, a very nice thing about the adiabatic memories, but they're very slow in comparison. Um, with the ATS memory, of course, you have this sort of oscillating uh, coherence between the spin and the polarization mode. Um, and so that is a very different mechanism behind it. In between, you can actually, um, if you have a very strong ATS splitting, you really split the, the peaks widely, you can actually get an EIT-like mechanism of this dark state polariton for even this broadband signal. It's hard to get rid of all of this polarization, all of the excited state, but um, you can do it. It turns out it's just a lot more demanding on say how much laser power you need uh, to actually do this. So I just wanted to mention that um, this paper also looked at the efficiency scalings and showed basically that, you know, this ATS memory works well if you don't have very good optical depth. So these blue lines are showing the optimal. And it sort of tops out um, at not quite 100% efficiency for these parameters that we used versus the EIT memory, which is in these red lines. So you need much higher optical depths, but the efficiency can approach 100% um, for those optical depths. And similarly, the bandwidth of the ATS memory works better uh, for higher bandwidths, whereas the EIT is maybe better suited to lower bandwidths or, or narrow signals in frequency domain. Um, uh, Lindsay? Yes. Um, we've got a question from Paul. Uh, does the fact that the signal is oscillating limit how completely you can switch out at a particular time? So I'm not quite sure I get the question, but um, so you do need very good timing, I guess, for uh, to get the, the transfer between um, Hi, so maybe the same I can, way that I, I guess. I can clarify the question. Can you sure. go back one slide? Yeah. So I'm just looking at, at C in the third column where you're, you're continuing to have the oscillations in the polarization. Yeah. And so that means that you you see those little echoes uh, appearing. That's right. Photon coming yeah. out. So the question is, are you limited if you wanted to only have a switch out at say time t, you know, time one, or mm -hmm. I'm looking at the top labels, um, are you limited in the ATS scheme because of the fact that you have these continued oscillations? So for the simple control where we're just leaving it on all the time um, or using these square pulses, yes, uh, but we can do, um, some optimization of the control pulses to actually do better and get all of the, we can sort of shut off these, these echoes if we tailor the, the control pulses. And, and in the simplest scheme, how much energy or how much probability is in those later pulses? So I guess it depends very much on the parameters that we use. Um, I, I don't have a good number, but I, you know, I guess just looking at this, it's sort of a, probably only 50% in the first um, recall here. Um, yeah, okay, great, yeah. thank you. Welcome. All right. So yeah, I'll also maybe just skip this. It's just a map of different parameter regimes in terms of bandwidth and optical density where one might choose an EIT memory in the yellow versus an ATS memory is sort of higher bandwidth and lower optical depth. The ATS memory seems to do well. And um, I guess the message of this work is really that understanding your parameter regime and um, more than just sort of turning knobs in the laboratory, you can actually do, you can do get better optimization by understanding the mechanism and the difference between this, I think maybe this goes to Paul's question where, you know, turning off 
whether you need to sort of turn off things correctly or optimize the pulses in different ways can can give you the better memory in the end. So understanding the, the mechanism behind this, I think, um, is part of the message here. So uh, that's all sort of numeric so far, but we did this in our experiments. So we started, this is just a top view. This is actually our experiment we used for the quantum simulation. Uh, we did a lot of these experiments using warm atoms to begin. So we just used um, laser cooled atoms from a MOT when we were first trying out these experiments. And the parameters we use are fairly modest in things like three milliwatts of control power, say, uh, to enact this scheme. And our signals were around 30 microwatts. So these started off in the classical regime. Um, and we just wanted to demonstrate sort of proof of concept that this works. And so you can see this, um, we have, you know, send in a signal and get it out at a fixed time later. Um, by turning off the control, we can um, recall that signal at a later time. And then using also these sort of shaped pulses, we can get a better readout, uh, more efficient, and can also sort of tailor the shapes of our output pulses by, by controlling the shape of the control beam. Um, we also showed sort of to some degree that uh, we could do sort of um, this continuous crossover from the EIT to the ATS memory by changing the, the splitting of our ATS peaks and seeing um, the different timing, the different characters. So, Part of the struggle, we actually, well, the history of this whole project is that we were originally trying to do EIT memory in our system, but we didn't phase lock the lasers. And so you do need nice coherence between your two lasers in order for the EIT memory to work. But later we were able to do that, um, but it is much more demanding sort of technically than just doing this ATS memory. So, um, so we're able to see the, the transition between these. And another measurement we did was to show that there is actually phase coherence between the signal that we send in get out. And the way we did that is by sending a reference signal at the time of the output. So these are the control or the signal. And then we send a reference pulse at the same time as we recall the second pulse. And by changing the relative phase between these two pulses, we can see either constructive or destructive interference in the dark with a visibility of about 90%. So again, these were just some of the first experiments, but we can show that we do have this nice phase relationship between the signal and output, which leads us to believe that these would be um, fairly high fidelity uh, signals in the quantum regime. That's sort of the next thing to do on the list. One thing we did was move towards single photon level storage. We don't have a yet a true single photon source, um, but just by turning down the, the laser and using a weak coherent pulses, we were able to show that we could actually store and retrieve these pulses at the single photon level. Uh, so now we have histograms instead of oscilloscope traces uh, for our data. And we were able to show that actually this method, because it is on resonance, actually has very low noise. So for example, you can see um, this is the output pulse. And then by either turning off just the control beam or by leaving the output, what are the signals that we measure? And we see very low um, counts at the output, leading us to a signal to noise ratio of about 40 um, by testing these different regimes. So um, this is in contrast to some of the other atomic broadband memories that actually suffer from four wave mixing and uh, have some issues with noise. So it showed that, yes, this is a good method because it is on resonance um, for that. And another nice uh, sort of cute experiment one can do is to show some temporal beam splitting using this. And this is sort of goes to the, the photonic processing applications that I, I mentioned at the beginning, where um, you can think of the, the memory process like a beam splitter. And the, the sort of way to think about that is that you have an electromagnetic signal coming in, and then you transform that to a spin degree of freedom. And that's sort of like switching from this mode, the input mode to this output mode. And then the other output mode is sort of the transmitted light. Um, so you can store it and send the light sort of in the spin wave as the as this mode. And then by applying another control pulse later at the readout, what you're doing is transforming spin back into an electric field out. So you can kind of think of this like a two, the memory like a tube. Um, and the nice thing about that is that the beam splitters don't have to be sort of 100% efficient by tailoring the strength of the control pulse, you can send um, light in and then recall it at different times, sort of partial recall at different times at the output. And in this case, we showed that, you know, we could do it in sort of four different time bins. And this leads us to be able to do this sort of photonic manipulation where you could imagine having pulses at different times um, where you could do, you know, if you actually sent single photons in, you not know 
time bin they're going to come out in and that uh, allows you to start doing some um, real quantum information processing in that way. Uh, we also show that these were coherent. I don't have that slide up here, um, but it is sort of a real coherent process that we're able to do by adjusting the control powers. And you can think of it as sort of just reading part of the spin wave out um, at each one of these beam splitting control times. The last thing I'll show here is that we then we have a BEC in the lab, and so we thought, okay, let's just try out our memory using our really cold atoms, um, in part because we know that the storage um, and I showed so far sort of at the hundreds of nanoseconds level, and we figured we could probably do better than that. And um, the reason for that limited storage time is largely that the spin waves that we are creating have a very um, small spatial periodicity, which means that there is thermal diffusion that starts to sort of scramble those spin waves and um, yeah, basically make the diffraction grading fuzzy so that uh, the recall becomes less efficient over time. And so by moving to the BEC, we're able to sort of overcome some of that thermal diffusion just because the atoms will be moving much more slowly. And so we can see if we measure efficiency versus temperature of our atoms um, as we get colder and colder and reach sort of the BEC threshold uh, here, we get efficiencies up to 30% um, from more like 10% at our uh, temperatures. Um, we do see the efficiency start to take a plummet here, but that's really just because um, our atom number is dying because we're evaporating so many of the atoms to make them cold that our uh, optical density is, is decreasing as well. Um, but we sort of are encouraged by the, that increased in efficiency um, and also storage time well, on the next slide I'll show, but uh, we also did this at the single photon level. And um, one other effect that is just purely technical is that the BC is very small. So as we send our beam in, um, when the atoms are hot, most of it will be absorbed, but when the atoms are cold, they're just smaller and our beams were just too big so that uh, the light was sort of escaping around the edges of these cold clouds. So we could see that it started with 25 micron beam. If we made the beam bigger, the efficiency uh, decreased. And um, so we can attribute it to this just missing, we're just missing some of the, um, the atoms. So by doing better optics, we think we can do better with that. Uh, we did see an increase in the storage time up to about 16 microseconds. So it's still not a huge amount of time. And um, we think that it's just the magnetic field environment, which we haven't taken too much care about in our system uh, is now the limiting factor. So there's also going to be some magnetic dephasing because there are, uh, we're just thinking about hyperfine levels, but there are Zeeman substates within these that are um, sensitive to the magnetic field. Um, and so we get these yeah, storage times on it's sort of tens of microseconds level now. Um, again, this has characteristics, so we can also show that. So um, lastly, we did some numerical calculations just to predict what we think the efficiency could be if we improve some of the parameters in, in the laboratory. So um, for instance, if we could get these probe beams much smaller, we can sort of approach this 100% level at a one micron beam. So that would take sort of high numerical aperture imaging, um, but it's not unheard of to be able to do that in a cold atoms experiment. And we also predict that the lifetime, if we could get rid of uh, some of these um, noise processes uh, to do with the magnetic fields can approach sort of the hundreds of milliseconds level, at which point that this memory would be actually very practical in the networking applications that I talked about sort of for synchronization and, and photonic manipulation. Um, in Lindsay, terms of noise, yeah. Um, we've got another question from Elizabeth. Um, is emotional dephasing of the spin wave the only effect of the inhomogeneous broadening in the hot gas, or is the storage time limited by the inhomogeneous width of the ensemble, or just doesn't matter because emotional dephasing comes into play first? So, no, these are very good points. I think probably, yes, the latter, the emotional dephasing is coming in first. Um, and it, it depends a little bit on the, the angles of the beams that we're using. So I didn't talk about it, but we have the ability to change that. We can see the change in the lifetime based on on does make me think that it is largely the emotional dephasing. But yes, I think there's other effects and the, there's a little bit of this buried in this, this plot actually. So there's, you know, thinking about an elastic collisions and, and recoil. So some, when you're getting to very long lifetimes, there are going to be other effects. And yes, even the, the fact that our probe beam is not uniform across the, the whole gas, um, sorry, our, our control beam, uh, we want to try to make that as flat as possible. And, you know, all of these effects are going to start mattering more as we get into these longer lifetimes. So yeah, that's a great question. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, also thinking about noise. So 
the ATS protocol um, basically lets you get away with um, some sort of <laughs> actually the the lower angle um, writing that usually will cause noise, but in um, in like in the protocols like EIT, but uh, you can use less power with the uh, ATS protocol as compared to the EIT at a particular bandwidth, which means that with less power, there's less chance of getting stray uh, photons and also four wave mixing. And so the ATS protocol is better in the high bandwidth regime than the EIT just because you're using less power. All right. So by going to the BC, we were able to see that, um, you know, we can get high bandwidth and low noise and in principle, good efficiency and long lifetimes with, with these cold atoms. Although there are going to be some, of course, the technical trade-offs. It's not the easiest thing to make a BEC, of course. Um, but they are less susceptible to some of these magnetic field problems just because the BECs are smaller. So if we can get a smaller beam size, we can get a, a, an efficient um, cloud or efficient memory. And so that's um, one of the ways that we're moving towards in the future. So I want to talk about something else. I'm going to just wrap this up quickly. Um, what are the future steps here in terms of our atomic quantum memories? We want to actually start working with quantum information. So can, how are we going to encode information? Polarization is one option, but I actually think time bin encoding might be easier uh, as a place to start. Um, yes, and so you know we just need to learn about how to do quantum state preparation and detection. So learning a little, well, using a little bit more quantum optics than we've been doing so far. Um, also like to move towards sort of more practical applications, like can we interface multiple systems um, of quantum memories and also store more than one mode of information at a time? Uh, and we have some ideas about how to do that. And then also thinking about the sort of practicalities of things. So, uh, you know, a whole laboratory for one qubit storage is not um, a practical <laughs> a scheme. So um, we're starting to work with some collaborators to think about maybe portability, a robustness, and even working with warm atoms, which is related to what I do want to talk about next. All right. So actually, if there's any other questions about the memory, I can pause too. All right. Uh, yeah, we did get a couple more here. So, so one more from Elizabeth. So oh, uh, your ATS memories are broadband for atomic memories. Do you think you could store optical frequency qubits? Optical frequency. Sorry. So like, I just mean frequency encoding instead of time bit encoding. Yeah, so um, I think so. So we, we are sort of addressing all hyperfine, excited state hyperfine levels. Well, um, we're addressing one of them, but we're sort of close to many of them. So we, we haven't, really wrapped up these results yet, but we've shown like frequency conversion between the different um, states in the excited state. Um, but yeah, we can definitely um, address multiple say levels in the excited state, which are a few hundreds of megahertz separated. So you could imagine doing frequency um, qubits, I guess, on those different levels, if that's what you're thinking about. Um, I, Cause I think the I same actually, waves that you create would be similar. But I was actually wondering, like your 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 memory bandwidth is pretty big, right? Mm -hmm. Could you fit a couple of frequency bins in your memory bandwidth? I see. So that's yeah. So I'm trying like the yes, I guess I see what you're saying. Um. I guess if you got why yeah so practice sorry in the in the system that we've got with the splittings that we've got I think probably not quite but I think if you could get your Otler town splitting to be slightly greater than yes um, that would work when they're in the bandwidth I'm not sure how that changes the the shapes of the outputs um, but in principle I think that might work so anyway that's an interesting thought I hadn't really thought about it before but thanks. Um. Okay, so one other question. So what limits the memory bandwidth in the BEC case? So currently we think it's just magnetic field um, changes in the R experiment. We really don't have great control over the magnetic field. Um, especially we're sort of changing things at this time. So we think that's the issue, um, but yeah, <laughs> to be determined to see if we can fix that, if there's anything else underlying. Okay, maybe I'll ask one quick question too. Sure. So, um, so by going to BEC, I guess you're, you're trying to increase your optical density 
uh, to increase kind of the strength of the light matter interactions in some sense. I'm wondering, do you consider like using a cavity and, and then I guess you, you could even use single atoms or it'd have much less stringent requirements on the optical density. Yes. So, I mean, that's sort of the, there's a trade-off. So yes, you could go to a cavity that's, it's got its own technical difficulties, but that is an equally good um, way to do it. Like a cav, so both the, the, um, the ensemble and the BC, you get this sort of spatial selectivity, sort of I talked about with the spin wave and, you know, the, it's sort of like super radiance, right? The, the light all gets emitted in one direction. Um, so you can do that with the ensemble or with the cavity is the say, you know, the other way to do that, where you have that, that sort of firing the light into the, into the mode of interest. Um, so I, I do think that, yeah, that's probably um, something that can be done. It's just the overlap between people who do atoms and cavities and people who do memory hasn't happened yet, I guess. So, um, similarly, yeah. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so I don't have a lot of time left. I don't know when you want me to stop talking, you can interrupt me. <laughs> um, but I did wanna talk a little bit about our work with the microwave atom optics. Um, so it's sort of a, a recent um, endeavor that has come about just thinking about the electronic structure of our alkali atoms and talking with some of my other colleagues working in totally different sort of quantum systems um, and who think about microwaves. Um, and some, you know, it's a tool that we've had in our lab. I don't know what just happened to my computer here with the spinning beach ball. Um, try not to go back and forth too much. Here we go, ah, bad transition. Um, and you know, thinking about microwaves, I'm like, well, we have microwaves. And so I just sort of started thinking a little bit more about, can we actually exploit uh, the microwave transition together with the optical transitions that we have in the alkali metal atoms to do something interesting? Um, and so of course, if we think about the different kinds of transitions, the usual optical transitions, the ones I've been talking about so far are the, the usual easy, uh, fairly large um, line width transitions that are that way because they're electric dipole allowed. Um, in, in contrast, the, the two hyperfine ground states that we were using for the storage levels in the previous part of this work, I called a forbidden transition, but that really just means that they're magnetic dipole allowed. So if you have a strong enough oscillating magnetic field, you can drive these transitions. Uh, it's just that they're a lot weaker than the electric dipole transitions by a factor of their frequency cubed and also um, a factor of alpha because magnetic and electric fields are different. But if you can make the magnetic field strong enough, you can drive these transitions. And so there are a number of different applications one can think about. So, you know, the inspiration when I was first talking to people was this idea of microwave to optical transition that a lot of qubits are encoded as microwaves, but uh, quantum communications networks are optically encoded in photons. Can you actually transduce information from a microwave regime to an optical regime? So there's a lot of work looking at this. These are some examples thinking about doing this with atoms. Um, and so that was one of the first motivations, but you know, there's actually a lot of other fun things you can do when you have a, a strong microwave transition. Uh, magnetometry is one of them, and this is becoming one of the sort of more practical quantum sensing applications where we can use these very sensitive atoms and their magnetic dipole moments to, to measure sensitive magnetic fields. So there's some recent papers looking at bio sensing, for example, um, with these systems. Uh, there's also an application called radio over fiber, which is transforming radio signals, both RF and microwave into optical signals classically um, to send you know, those signals that are you know, RF and traveling through airwaves, that what we call airwaves into fiber. Um, and so there's some work using atoms to do that as well. And then based on our, our previous work, we're also thinking about, can we actually uh, harness this, this strong microwave transition as a tool for microwave quantum memory? Because really we are storing information in those states. So maybe we can think about ways to, uh, you know, flip states around and, and improve the, the storage lifetimes that way. So we set up a system to really simple system to start thinking about these um, microwaves. So you can see here, there's a glass stem coming into a copper sort of can. It's, it's the size of a soup can. Actually, can you see me? It looks like my camera's off. Um, uh, your, your camera was off. Uh, it's Wait, looks like it's on, but it's black. Right? Okay. Yeah, that sometimes happens. Um, okay, well, let me just... Sorry, I was just waving my hands around and then realized I didn't have my camera on. So. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, there, I'll use the, I have a different one. We'll go to that one. Um, yep, that works. So, you know, I've worked with ultra-cold atoms my whole career. It 
sort of was a new thing to start thinking about warm atoms. Um, but what we've done is basically created a, a small Pyrex cell inside of this copper microwave cavity. The cavity was uh, manuf designed and built by one of my colleagues who, who works with these in the context of optomechanics. Um, they designed one at 6.8 gigahertz that would be compatible with um, rubidium. And one of my now former PhD students just graduated, uh, sort of took off just, just seeing what we can do with this system. And so um, this is this kind of setup that we have. We had a little mini vacuum system so that we could dispense um, rubidium vapor pressure as we like we could change it. Um, and then we've also put some magnetic fields, um, coils, which are just represented by the solenoid here around the cavity. And the nice thing about a copper cavity as opposed to say a superconducting cavity inside of a fridge is that magnetic fields can penetrate it. So you can actually uh, tailor the magnetic field environment for the atoms as well as the magnetic field. And the last thing we were able to do is actually just drill a couple of holes along the axis or along the um, radius of the cavity here. So this is the, the round ends are on the, the two ends here, and this is the cylinder. Um, and we send some light through the cavity and through the, um, through the vapor cell in the center without really changing the quality factor of the cavity. So the way that this cavity is designed, uh, which you can see in this plot here, is that the magnetic field is strongest and fairly uniform along this axis where the vapor cell is. The field is actually pointing in the longitudinal direction here um, because the currents are mostly circulating around this um, cylinder. So by putting in a couple holes there, we actually did not really affect the current patterns and that kept the quality factor fairly high. So we're able to optically probe the atoms, drive them with microwaves in this cavity enhanced system and also may uh, vary them DC magnetic fields just using coils surrounding the cavity. So we have a lot of control over the system here. So um, one of the techniques we use is called a double resonance. And what we do is we have this sort of same three level system I talked about earlier, where we send in a probe to the, these atoms, now warm atoms, um, and we can sort of see what happens when we turn on the microwave. So if we just send in a probe, basically we would um, optically pump all of the atoms into a ground dark state. Uh, and we'd see low, we'd see the probe basically transmitted because there's nothing to absorb. And then when we turn on the microwaves, we pump atoms back from the, the lower state, say to the upper state, and now the probe has something to absorb. So the transmission is going to be less when we turn on the microwaves. And so this is the basic, very basic signal that we can use um, here. And we can see that as we turn these um, microwaves on and off, we actually we can see this optical pumping time. It's not super fast. Uh, it's over the sort of sub millisecond time scale. And then when we turn it off, we can actually see a little bit of ringing here, which is the Rabi flopping of the microwaves as they sort of settle back into a new steady state um, in that ground state. And so that Rabi frequency, if we measure it, gives us a Rabi frequency of around um, just over 100 kilohertz for about a watt of power into the microwave cavity. So it's fairly modest powers. We're able to get a pretty good coupling uh, between the different microwave states. Uh, these states do have a, um, a substructure. So we've got two hyperfine ground states. They split in a magnetic field into their Zeeman sublevels. And so the lower state has three of those levels and the upper state has five. And if we turn on a DC magnetic field in the background, we can actually resolve these different um, Zeeman sublevels. So we have some state control over these um, microwave transitions. So oh, this is a very fuzzy picture, I apologize. Um, so one of the first sort of demonstration experiments we did was to uh, do this sort of radio over fiber um, technique where we took um, a radio signal, used that as a modulation to a microwave signal. So instead of a radio, AM or FM radio works, we modulated this microwave signal, which was at 6.8 gigahertz. We transmitted either over a wire or through air over an antenna and then into the cavity. And then there was a rubidium cell, also, I don't know where the picture went, um, in this cavity. And then we send the optical probe through it. And then on the optical probe, we're able to measure a modulation, which was the original modulation that we sent into the microwave. So we're basically, the idea is that you transduce from a modulation on micro sig microwave signal to a modulation on an optical signal, which is not actually optical to, or microwave to optical transduction, but it's sort of one step removed from that, but still has some practical applications. So um, we can think about doing this as sort of just a transfer uh, matrix kind of picture where if the transmission is varied by something, some parameter, we don't really care what that parameter is, but if that parameter is time varying, we can just do sort of a Taylor expansion picture so that that variation multiplies 
or the sensitivity to that variation multiplies the variation. And so this is just a first order approximation, but it, it works reasonably well uh, to do this. And so by varying the transmission, because we vary either the amplitude or the frequency, we can get our signals out. So the, by varying the amplitude, if we park on the, the side of the absorption signal, we vary, um, sorry, I guess this is the amplitude. If we vary the amplitude, the, the absorption changes. And so the transmission will change with the same frequency that we, we modulate the amplitude with. And similarly with the frequency by stay, staying on the side of the absorption peak, if we modulate the frequency, we modulate the detuning, which then modulates the, the transmission of the signal. So we're able to do both AM amplitude modulation and frequency modulation of these signals through the atoms. And these are just uh, actual audio signals of a song that we send in as the modulation signal, much like a radio. And you can read it out in either AM or FM. The signals don't look they are very, actually very similar if you do a proper sort of um, comparison. This is just to show the general shape is pretty similar. And we actually have sound files, which you can listen to this song transduced through the atoms, which is um, just kind of a fun uh, thing to do. Um, so that's sort of basic picture there. Um, the last thing I'll just mention, we're hoping to post these results on the archive this week, is that we can also use this technique to do uh, microwave assisted optical pumping. This goes by a few different names. Um, but the idea is that now if we think about there being multiple sort of levels in this ground state, which I showed we can resolve, um, the microwave signals can be selective between certain of those eight um, ground states that we have. And by um, changing the orientation of the external field with respect to the polarization of the microwave field, what you can do is actually change the, what we call atomic polarization, the distribution of atoms between say the three ground states, depending on the microwave frequency. So if you have a probe um, say, which has a polarization of sigma plus, and it would um, sort of naturally connect these two levels. If you turn the microwaves on between that, these two happen to be degenerate and they're resonant here, the atoms will optically come into this level and so it'll have a high transmission, which is shown with peak one here. Whereas if you tune the microwaves to be resonant between these two levels, instead you get a reduction in transmission um, because we now have atoms in this level. And the reduction isn't huge, but um, this has to do with the fact that there's Doppler shifts, but we, we can see these signals and we can, we can use that. So um, Lindsay? I'm about out of time, yes. Um, Paul is wondering what's the, the bandwidth of this conversion process. Um, yeah, I have that on an extra slide, but it's it's not huge. It's only um, a couple of kilohertz, two or three kilohertz, something like that. So. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, sort of in the audio range, I guess, um, is what where that worked. All right. So. Yeah. So my last slide was just saying that we can also do this process of um, atomic state sort of tailoring in, in the off resonant regime. And we can actually use this to tailor the, um, to rotate the polarization. So this is actually a, a paramagnetic Faraday rotation where we can see a difference. This is just measured um, the two signals at uh, out of photo um, at a polarizing beam splitter. So we can see that the two linear polarizations get split. And depending on the microwave detuning on this axis, we can sort of rotate the signal in one direction or in the other. Um, and we could imagine using this as a way to rotate polarization by controlled by um, the microwave frequency itself. So um, sort of interested in these in very general and thinking about warm atoms and microwaves. Um, we have another idea about using this for magnetometry. We've also been working a little bit on developing our own iridium microcells and then looking towards the future, thinking about, you know, microwave to optical conversion for real um, instead of just this modulation transfer. Um, also thinking about using this in the quantum memory, as I mentioned earlier, and then also maybe more general warm atom memory schemes using the same techniques. So um, that about ends things. So um, in respect to the atomic quantum memory, I've told you about this Altler Towns protocol that we've demonstrated in the lab over the last few years, uh, that it's very broadband um, and works well for low optical depth systems showed how we can use cold atoms to improve the performance. And then more recently talked about the microwave cavity and atoms and how using this cavity enhances these microwave signals strong enough so that we can do some neat experiments using warm atoms. Um, and we think this is actually a very versatile platform and looking forward to using that in the future. So I'll finish with now a year old <laughs> slide of people in masks. Um, 
and um, just you know highlight the work of uh, Andre in particular, who did a lot of the warm atom work, and uh, Erhan and uh, and India, who've led a lot of the quantum atomic memory experiments over the last few years. So thank you very much for your time, um, and I'll happy to take any more questions, time permits. <laughs>